Hello and welcome to this month's episode of Fraud Talk. I'm Brett LaFontaine, video producer for the ACFE. In a few moments, you'll hear an excerpt from a recent member webinar titled, A Conversation About Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the Anti-Fraud Field. The panel of speakers include our moderator, Dr. Lisa Walker, Monica Madi Dawadi, Charles Washington, and Beth Mara Kessler. So, Beth Mara, I'd love for you to share with us, help us understand who needs to participate in this conversation and why is their, their participation so important to this conversation? Yeah, it's, the, the, the short answer to that question is everyone. We're really all in this together. And until everybody feels represented and safe to be present and be themselves uh, in the workplace, no one's going to be safe to be themselves. So without the active engagement of everyone in the organization and the conversation, we're not going to be able to achieve full equity and belonging for all. And I say belonging because it's not just about inclusion. It's really important that everyone feels a true sense of belonging in the business and on the team. Um, so I, I think one of the big challenges, just if I can reflect on, on why this has been such a difficult uh topic in the workplace is that many senior leaders, including me, I, I mean, I grew up in a world where I felt that deliberate steps were taken by organizations to avoid conversations about diversity at all costs. Uh, people were really tacitly encouraged by organizations to avoid conversations, um, use politically correct language, homogenize into a corporate culture, and quite honestly, colorblindness and, and politically correct language were expected in normal. Normalized. Let me give you two quick examples. Um, over the years, I've seen HR partners have um, removed names from applicants' resumes to ensure that diverse candidates wouldn't get excluded from consideration because of biases um, that might result from gender, race, or ethnicity. Another example is one of my companies had a facilitated conversation between our African-American employee resource group and the company's leaders. And the first thing that came up was that the group wanted to change their name from the African-American network to the black network because members didn't all identify as African-American. And the, the conversation that ensued with the leaders was so incredibly interesting because everyone was sharing that they were taught that calling someone black wasn't politically correct in the workplace. And they felt terrible that what they thought, when they thought they were doing the right thing, it was really the wrong thing all along. So it's important for us to have open and authentic conversations to help organizations and leaders acknowledge and quickly understand and, and unlearn some deep-rooted behaviors that have been groomed or accepted for a long time. Um, I believe we can all be catalysts for making sure that these conversations are happening. But for real change in any business, the most senior leaders need to be full invested in making that happen. Yeah, thank you, Betmar. So I'm hearing that it's everyone needs to be included, and it's also about how you're having those conversations. And you mentioned that senior leaders need to be involved in this conversation. Charles, I'd love for you to speak, uh, share with us a little bit more about why it's so critically important for founders and senior leaders of organizations to be part of this conversation. Uh, thanks, it's great. I'd just like to comment to something that Beth Mara just said. Um, so that's the reason why I didn't get that job was, was because of my name. Um, <laughs> so I thought that was quite funny. You know, you know, there have been numerous times when, when, when I've actually thought that. You know, it, it, it's just that my name is typically a a black family name and so you know being black you can't help but but kind of look at that sometimes when you know what your qualifications are and and then you may not get the attention that you thought that you would get but you know um coming up in my background um you know which is very vast from a, a racial standpoint in terms of you know growing up in in an area of segregation integration, um, you know, having to have to deal and see some of these things, you know, going to a point where, you know, sometimes occasionally, uh, you know, visiting my grandmother and, and then realizing that, um, you know, she lived in South Carolina and then realizing, you know, there's a sign in the back of the doctor's office that says, you know, um, Negroes only. 
and then, and then trying to understand that um, from going to a movie theater and realizing that you're sitting in a different part of the theater than white people. And it was, and as a young child, it was very difficult for me to really accept that. Um, and, and then, so I look at myself today and even though, you know, some may consider um, me to be, you know, somewhat successful in terms of what I've achieved over my life, but the thing that gets me the most and, and where I think our, our leaders really need to, 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 to concentrate on or, or get involved in this, into this conversation that, you know, equality, fairness, equity, it doesn't really work unless it works at the lowest levels of the organization. You know, it's really fine for people like me to work my way up the ladder and I do good and I learn from that. Um, but sometimes what I see from a leadership standpoint, we, we really tend to, to look at um, equity. We tend to look at equality. Um, you know, based on the people that are, that are actually fighting for it the most. And I think at times that I'd like to see us get away from a, a defensive posture where we're constantly trying to defend our right as a point to being offensive. And we get to a place where we can actually live and enjoy the rights that have already been bestowed upon us. And I think from a leadership standpoint is that um, leaders have to begin the conversation. Leaders must begin that conversation. And the problem with that sometimes is that, is that we so often think that if the leaders have to begin that conversation, what we fail to sometimes recognize is that um, those leaders are not immune from having their own biases or unconscious biases as well. So they may not know how to do that. Um, but, to make, but to take that step forward, it begins with leadership and addressing their unconscious bias and getting them to, to actually realize it's, it's, it's almost like alcoholism. You can't fix it unless you admit the fact that you have it. Charles, I love your points on um, unconscious bias. And I wanted to share, you know, for thinking about actionable things that we can do as leaders and as anti-fraud professionals, one thing we did across our entire organization is um, unconscious bias training. And we not only did, you know, uh, online sessions that everybody could watch, but then afterwards, we got together in small groups at a local level. And the first thing that our team did was lead us through an exercise where you wrote like 20 things about yourself. Then you had to go introduce yourself to someone you didn't know and you could not talk about those 20 things. And part of that lets you feel what it was like not to bring your whole or authentic self to work, what it would be like, Beth Mara, to your point about, you know, hiding a piece of yourself or trying to be you know, too homogenous and not have that uniqueness. And it just, it opened a whole other window of dialogue and conversation and had people think differently um, about what they're doing and how they're doing things. And so if, if people are listening and taking notes, I would highly recommend that unconscious bias related conversation along with the listening sessions. Yeah. And, and, and um, because one of the things that we've got to recognize and, and come to a realization with, and I had this experience, um, Bias has no boundaries. Bias has no color. Bias has no limits. Um, I was attending a course once, and I took this sort of unconscious bias test. And I was in the room, and we were all law enforcement, and so I was in the room with maybe 30 or so other uh, white law enforcement officials, and we're all taking this test. And it, it was a racial bias test. And I failed that test just as everyone else did. And I was black and I was not expected to fill that test. And it was a good point, a good exercise for me to realize that biases don't always necessarily come from the color of your skin, but it also comes from the environments that you place yourself in and what you've learned over the course of years. And it all feeds into your bias. And that's something that we have to be very careful of because so often when we think about bias, we're talking about you no know, you know, race, religion, color, creed, but Bias has no limits, and we've got to be careful with that to the point of understanding that we all have biases, but the good part is we have to recognize that we have them. Yeah, I, I'd like to just add on that because I, I think that's a really important um, 
a really important point. I think, you know, biases also affect how we perceive things and how we filter things. And sometimes our biases can lead us to not presume positive intent. Um, that we were having that conversation um, with our, our black network um, in my organization. And one of the folks stood up and said, you know, I'm really to the leaders of the organization. I'm really frustrated because people don't say hello to me in the hall or look at me because I'm black. And I stood up and I said, oh, I thought they weren't saying hello to me because I was a lesbian. And all of a sudden the whole room broke out laughing because you know, it's so easy for us to to assume, like you said, because of your name, Charles, that, you know, you, you question, is the reason that I didn't get this job because of my name? Is the reason that somebody is not paying attention to me or not talking to me or including me because of the color of my skin or because something I represent? And I think, you know, it, part of the unconscious bias training has to be about um, us teaching ourselves and, and wiring ourselves to presume positive intent and come from a place of, you know, kind of helping to, to, to talk about a conversation instead of shutting down because we perceive that it's against us, if that makes sense. Yes. Very good point. Very good point. Yeah. Such great points. Thank you all for that. And, and you know, I, I generally say to the leaders and the teams that I support and coach, we all have biases. If you have a brain, you have biases. We all do. I mean, something as simple as the reason we remove our hand quickly from a flame or a hot stove is because we have a bias towards keeping safe and a bias against hurting ourselves. So in the same way, we have conscious and unconscious biases about so many things, including race. You know, I was uh, one of my leaders who happens to be uh, COO of a major uh, global tech company. And after some time of working together, he said to me, you know, for the longest time, he felt that it was perfectly okay that for his organization, they had their diversity and inclusion officer and his or her folks who worked with them to ensure that their organization uh, was maintaining diversity to the level that they had agreed to and that they were working on inclusion. Now, after doing some amount of introspection and some really thoughtful work on himself and becoming so much more self-aware, that was an eye-opener for him that the work around diversity, equity, and inclusion if it doesn't start from the senior leaders, if it doesn't start from the head of the organization and filters down throughout, it will not work, will not work at all. And so that leads us in then to trying to understand who, because we, we're talking about the essential nature of this conversation and who are all the folks who needs to be a part of this conversation. And so far we've determined that everyone needs to be Yet, especially in the last couple of months, we've been hearing a lot about including allies in the conversation and how essential allies are. And Beth Mara, I'd love for you to share with us what we really mean by allies, who are these important allies, and what are their roles, and what are some effective ways for allies to show up in the workplace? It's a great question. Um, in, the, in the end, we all should be allies uh, to one another. But, um, you know, kind of at its core, allies are the people that make conscious commitments to work in solidarity with oppressed groups in the struggle for equality. Um, one of the key concepts that always comes up when discussing the role of allies is the concept of privilege. Um, talk about a difficult conversation and one that, that's kind of spawned a lot of reaction from folks. The concept of privilege really has. But in order for somebody to be a really great ally, they have to be able to acknowledge their privilege and use the power of it to stand up for others to drive change. So unfortunately, the word privilege, when it's not really understood, it can spark feelings of being attacked or lead to communication breakdowns. And I'll tell you, I personally struggled with the concept before I completely understood it. I was on the board of an organization called the Matthew Shepard Foundation, uh, working with Judy Shepard, who was the mother of Matthew. And some of you may remember uh, Matt was uh, killed in a vicious anti-hate crime uh, years ago. And we were working on a number of initiatives to drive hate crime legislation. And we were talking about whose voice would be the most impactful in public conversations. And I remember Judy saying to me, as an ally, not a member of the LGBTQ community, 
my voice can be heard louder in a conversation than yours. And at first I was taken aback because I got a little defensive about that. And how can you talk about my struggles more than I can? And then the light bulb went off and I started to really understand the concept of privilege. So it's important for us to understand that when we talk about white privilege, we're not saying that a white person's life hasn't been hard. It just means that the, that the person's skin color isn't what's making it harder. And um, anybody in a majority group can be an ally to an oppressed minority group, but you have to commit to using your privilege, the words and actions to really drive forward momentum and struggle for equality. If we're silent, and not part of that minority group, our silence is deafening and the inaction becomes detrimental to progress. So a few steps that I take to show up as an ally is first of all, recognizing and acknowledging my privilege. I do spend time to educate myself about the history of the struggle. And I really encourage everybody to do that because if you don't understand um, and aren't educated about the struggle, it's hard to be a good ally. Um, I push for uh, educational opportunities and crucial conversations in the workplace uh, to keep an open dialogue, speak up when I see injustice or actions that result in inequality. That's hard to do, but very important. Um, I amplify the voices of, of those folks whose voices aren't coming through and make sure that their good ideas are being promoted and that they're getting credit attributions for their work. And then finally, I like to go out of my way to truly ensure that everyone feels welcome and included. And sometimes that's as easy as walking through the halls, smiling and saying hello to every single person you meet. So um, allies are really important and play a very important role in this. Beth Mara, I'd love to be able to, to add to that for a moment. Um, I, I think what you said about, you know, who's making the statements, the powerful statements. And I talked a little bit about the listening sessions that we hosted. And some of our most powerful statements, and they were really um, diverse groups, were from um, white male leaders. And one of them shared his Irish background, how he knew what it felt like to be discriminated from his family perspective, and that he has personally taken a board role in um, an organization that works to bring equity into um, academics across different racial and socioeconomic background, and, and he vowed to do more. And it was it was incredible. Um, and he did not initially want to speak in this session. He was like, this session isn't for me. And so I had to say, wait, actually, this is for everyone. And the, the beauty of the virtual environment was that I could be talking to him on, you know, an instant messenger type of platform and say, I want you to share something that's authentic to you. Um, this is a safe space for that conversation. But people want to hear from you. They want to understand that you care. Um, and, and they want to understand your perspective. And once he did, it was just it was incredible. People were thankful and they said, okay, I, I get it. Other people in the organization get it and people who don't look like me get it. And um, great point. Uh, I'd like to chime in as well. You know, from the ally standpoint, for me, building allies is really so much to do about building trust in people. And, you know, I've kind of traveled the world and had experiences with different cultures. And I don't think that I've ever been to another country and have worked in a different culture when I did not experience some type of, I would say, uh, a cultural or even a, a racial um, uh, or racial discrimination to some point. And it used to get me when I go to countries where there's predominantly no other race in that country, but the people that live there, but the indigenous people. So why would they be biased of me? I'm just the only person who's here right now this minute. And what I learned over time is building those allies got me to a point where I no longer had to be so defensive anymore, but I could really get on the offense. Um, and by building trust with some of those allies, when you build trust with those allies, they're actually able to carry your story for it. They're actually able to help you on the offense um, because in order for us to get away from this point where we are now, um, we have to get away from being on the defense um, and concentrate more on the offense, as one would say in a football game, because most games are not won with all the players operating in a defensive mode. Um, it's offense is where all the points are actually scored in most games. And so allies um, really help you build that level of trust 
so that you've got more people telling your story than just yourself. Yeah, yeah such an interesting point, Charles, where allies get to magnify the story. And at the same time, I keep hearing this question, especially as I'm working in organizations, hearing so, and often it's not being asked out loud, but you're reading it between the lines. So what is in this movement for allies? So on the one hand, we know that allies can do a tremendous work in magnifying the story for Black people and for folks of um, uh, for, for, for folks of color, but what is in this for allies? Beth, I wonder, Beth Mara, I wonder if you could um, share a little bit on that for us. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting question because I've spent a lot of time um, as a, 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 an executive sponsor of um, a bunch of resource groups where we've pushed allyship. And the question has always come up in, in terms of what is it in, you know, what's in it for the allies. The reality is, is that we all in some way, shape and form, just like Monica mentioned earlier, you know, there was a white man who was covering and almost did and, and was kind of hiding his Irishness. Um, I had some folks that, that I've worked with uh, when I've talked very openly about being an out lesbian um, come to me and, and you know, send me notes and say, thank you so much for being open and authentic and sharing. I'm Native American and I never told anybody um, or I'm a veteran and I've never told anybody. And I think the thing is, is that we've all learned what is alluded to, to talk about how, how we need to show up and almost in these homogenized ways. And I think by being allies, what we're doing is we're creating an environment where, as Charles said, we're building trust and we're creating a situation where people truly are feeling like they belong and feel welcome, which, back to your point, Lisa, is what makes organizations great and successful. Diversity makes us better. It does not it, 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 and, and it is so powerful um, if we if we truly get diversity and equity and inclusion right. So, um, you know, for allies, it's about being there. You know, humanity is about being there for other folks and having other folks be there for you when you need it. Um, so it, it's just about being a, being a human being from my perspective. That's beautiful. I, said, but I, I literally hear and feel your heart. It and, is. Uh, Charles, Charles, you were going to be adding something. Did I hear you? No, I was just saying that I, that I agree with Beth Mara. It's, 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 it's sort of like, you know, no one can live the full benefit of their lives living a lie, one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Either if you're, if you're hiding anything about yourself, there's just no way that anyone could ever be the person that they're truly meant to be or the person that they really want to be if they're fostering a lie within themselves. Because um, it's, it's just a hard thing to keep. Um, and so, you know, in this, in this place of, of building allies um, and living to your fullest extent, and this is what racism prevents. It prevents you from living to your fullest extent. Because in many cases, you know, people practice racism even when they didn't believe it. They just did it because they felt society thought that that was the right thing to do, not because they believed it, but just because they thought that was the right thing to do based on the social norms. And, that, and, and, and to me, that's a good example of, of living a lie. You know, it's really, it's, it's interesting you talk about that, Charles, because one of the things that was a big light bulb for me in the concept of privilege is that I, I actually was closeted for the majority for a lot of my career, and um, it was really hard. I was using kind of generic pronouns and not sharing with the world that I had the most amazing partner at the time, who's now my wife and three beautiful children, who are um, who are awesome adults right now. And um, the thing that was the, the thing that was most powerful for me was realizing that. I was able and I had the privilege of being able to cover my my sexual orientation where in a racism discussion, um, when, you know, when we're talking about somebody's race, there's no privilege given to being able to cover. If somebody sees you, Charles, or, you know, they see that you're a black man, they 
if I don't do my hair like this and I actually, you know, intentionally cover, I can I can actually pass as being a straight white woman, which gives me a, a, d a different degree of privilege. You're right. It's so hard and exhausting um, to have to cover who you are and make believe that, that you're not the person um, you you actually are on the inside. Sure, and 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 you know, that's why I wanted to. Racism, man. Sorry, Charlie. Oh, I was about to say, you know, racism has this funny way of attacking people in in ways that that you really wouldn't imagine. Um, you know, for example, you know, um, I once moved into a community, and I was really concerned about moving there because I had heard so much about this community being racist, and. Um, and I was really thinking about not moving there because I read so much and I heard so much about this neighborhood being racist until finally I met a person who lived there. And she, she said this thing to me and, is, and it stuck with me my entire life. And what she said, she says, Charles, if you are afraid of white people, don't move to this neighborhood. But if you're not afraid of white people, if white people don't make you feel un uncomfortable, Move to this neighborhood, and I'm quite sure um, you will probably have one of the best experiences of your life. I moved into the neighborhood. Um, after I told my wife that I wouldn't, we moved there, and it's been one of the best neighborhoods I've ever lived in, in in my entire life. And so, you know, racism has this way to take things away that you don't think about because you're only thinking on that defense again. And But once you can take it and turn it into an offense, um, it can truly open your eyes to things that you might not ever experience yeah. I wanted to add a comment about, you know, the ability to be on the offense, to be an ally, not be a bystander. And I remember um, very early in my career, I was out at a lunch and there was a person who was senior to me and then an individual who worked for me who was early stage in his career. And um, at that lunch, there happened to be a lot of flies around and I was swatting some of them away. And the senior person said, well, you should be used to that. You're from India. And I mean, I was just beyond taken aback at that point because that's not actually where my family is from or what I'm used to. And and the judge, more junior individual said, what do you mean by that? How could you say that to her? What are you trying to imply? And it suddenly opened this window. But to have somebody who really was just like, no, we're not going to stand up for this. And I think in the workplace, um, in your community, if you see someone say something, do something, um, the ability to just to stand up against that um, make a comment, be, uh, be an ally to that individual is so powerful. I mean, this is almost 15 years later, and I would not get that image removed from my mind. I would say, I need to do this and more for other individuals. As a leader, I need to make sure that individuals of, uh, you know, of, of diverse backgrounds have opportunities that they don't have a way that they feel like they're being held back because of their color. Yeah, Monica, so that situation really demonstrated the power of someone noticing and speaking up, right? And as Charles talked so brilliantly about racism, the lie, that we have to be intentional about dismantling the lie. So we've already established that this is a critical conversation. We've established that everyone needs to be part of this conversation, including and starting with the very leaders of the organization and building systems and processes and creating opportunities across the organization so that everyone can be involved, not just in the conversations, but in the actions that will imp increase equity, um, increase justice in the workplace. So, Monica. If we are going to um, have these really important and often difficult conversations in the workplace, we have established that they're essential. Are there some specific considerations that we need to make to ensure that everyone is included in these conversations? And, and from your standpoint, how are those happening? Share a little bit about that with us. Sure, happy to, uh, Lisa. So. Um, one of the things we did before our listening sessions is we set a whole series of um, ground rules. And we said that we wanted this to be a safe place for people to share and have a respectful dialogue. We wanted to get people's thoughts on systemic racism, how our communities have been impacted, and provide resources. So 
throughout the conversation. And then we wanted to hear what needed to change within our organizations to, to help individuals move ahead if, if they still thought there was a change that needed to be made. We made sure it was an open forum. It was not a presentation that was occurring. And we tried to have two individuals facilitate who were not necessarily at you know the very top of the organization because we wanted everyone to feel open to be able to speak and have dialogue. Um, we had it be optional, but I did ask people to join in the conversation so we could have a lot of perspectives. Um, and then we shared resources during the conversation books to be able to learn more articles, blogs, um, any information that's out there. One thing that I would recommend to this group, if you really want to be able to take action, is there's a CEO action for diversity and inclusion. We've taken the pledge as an organization to make meaningful change. And we've put on the um, site itself and with our pledge, the actions we're taking. But if you go to that website, you can see what all organizations who have signed the pledge have agreed to do and you can filter by different areas, by recruitment, by retention, um, by compensation, um, to understand what are some options that could be available to you. And I feel very proud that we've taken a, a very disciplined approach um, to saying, okay, let's look at let's look at the data. Let's see where we are. How do we change this within our organization? What do we need to do? Um, at an education level, what do we need to do at a recruitment level, at a retention level, so that we are making progress. And, and we follow and we track that um, every single quarter the way you might if you were you know, a publicly traded company tracking your earnings. And so to have that type of discipline behind we want to make a change um, has been really important. And we've put our you know, actions and our funds behind that as well. Thank you so much to our panelists for their insights on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the anti-fraud field. You can find more episodes of Fraud Talk at acfe.com forward slash podcast or anywhere you regularly listen to podcasts. This is Brett LaFontaine signing off.